both those of you on Click Meeting and those of you on Facebook Live. It's lovely to have you all. I'm here with Sister Lucy, my amazing co-pilot, who will be in the chat box on Click Meeting, ready to answer any questions or comments you have. Um, the fact that people are saying hello to me suggests that you can see and hear me, which is a good start. Excellent. Yes, if you do have any technical issues, though, um, Sister Lucy will hopefully be able to help you. But often most of them are resolved by just either logging out or logging back in again or using headphones um, if you can't hear me very well. So there we go. Welcome to those of you who are new. I'm Sister Carino, even though Click Meeting is telling you that my name is Sister Yasan, I'm just logging in using Sister Yasan's login details, but we share all things in common, for we are nuns. Um, so yeah, as I say, if you haven't been here before, this is, this is basically how the setup works. I'm going to talk about the coming Sunday's Gospel for about kind of 40 minutes or so. We're going to be using um, the church's traditional method of exploring the scriptures, which is the four senses, the literal, the allegorical, the anagogical and the moral, which are big ways of saying the literal, where can we find God in this passage? Where can we find the church? And where can we find the human person? So that's kind of how we're gonna structure our discussion. And also there'll be time for questions and comments at the end. Um, I'll be using a presentation and some documents that contain references to the scriptures and to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Pardon me, if you'd like to look at these in your own time, if you click on your initials, which should be above my head, this is all for the people in Click Meeting, by the way, I'm sorry, Facebook Live people, just, um, you have to zone out for a few seconds, maybe. But on Click Meeting, if you go to your initials above my head, you click, and then there's an option for shared files, and then you click that, and you can download the shared files, which I will be using this. Anything now? Any sound? No? Okay. Let just let me know once you see. We can try that again. So you can you can hear me now? Okay, cool. I will stick with this for now. This move this over here yeah if you can put headphones in if you can that will be very helpful and yes I've got the microphone as close to me as I can put it so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hold it over here if that's okay so so this is this is this is a good sound for people, is it? this works good marvelous in that case, off we can begin, as we always do, by turning to the Holy Spirit, 
who has inspired each word of the sacred scriptures as we pray together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, The Son of Man must be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but may have eternal life. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. No one who believes in him will be condemned, but whoever refuses to believe is condemned already because he has refused to believe in the name of God's only son. On these grounds is sentence pronounced that though the light has come into the world, men have shown they prefer darkness to the light because their deeds were evil. And again, and indeed, Everybody who does wrong hates the light and avoids it, for fear his actions should be exposed. But the man who lives by the truth comes out into the light, so that it may be plainly seen that what he does is done in God. So, for the fourth Sunday of Lent, we are in chapter 3, of the Gospel of John, a chapter which is taken up largely with Jesus's conversation with a man named Nicodemus, a man who, as we read in John chapter 3 verse 1, was a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus at the beginning of chapter 3 of John's Gospel by night, having heard of the signs that Jesus is working, and he begins their conversation by saying this. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Now, John has already kind of set the tone for this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, because what happens in John chapter 2 is we learn that we're in Jerusalem, in the heart of the Jewish faith. We read, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So this is where Jesus is, for this conversation with a Jewish leader about who Jesus is and his relation to the God of Israel. And we read in chapter two of John's gospel that what happens once Jesus enters Jerusalem is that he cleanses the Jerusalem temple. And this was our gospel for last week, the third Sunday of Lent. And we have the account of the cleansing of the temple here. As we we find at the end of the account of the, the uh, cleansing of the temple, we read at verse 18, the Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So Jesus in Jerusalem has just made a prophecy of his own resurrection. And we go on to read just at the end of that passage that many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. And so this is the context of why Nicodemus comes to Jesus, because Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, as a leader of the Jews, would have presumably heard about this incident at the temple. And he would have heard that many of the Jews in Jerusalem were now believing in the name of this guy, Jesus, because they were seeing the signs that he was doing. 
And so as we can see, if we go up to the top passage here, John 3, 1 to 2, Nicodemus explicitly says to Jesus, no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. So Nicodemus is wondering what's going on here. You're a rabbi, you're doing these signs. This suggests that there's some kind of connection between you and God, the God of Israel. What's going on here? So with this gospel passage we've got for the fourth Sunday, we're coming into the conversation part way through um, the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. So we're going to have a look quickly at what Jesus and Nicodemus have been saying to each other just before, just before this gospel passage starts. So we read starting at John chapter three, verse nine, Nicodemus says to Jesus, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to. Sorry, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. And this is the point at which our gospel passage for the fourth Sunday of Lent begins. With Jesus saying, As just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So what we've got here is we've got a teaching on the love of God and the sending of the son, which comes as part of Jesus's conversation with a key leader of the Jewish people, Nicodemus, a conversation in which Jesus begins to explain how he fits into the story of salvation history in perhaps the most significant place to have that conversation, Jerusalem, God's holy city and the home of his temple, which Jesus has just cleansed and used as the setting for a prophecy of his own resurrection. So that's a very quick look at the literal sense of our passage. And now we have a sense of the literal sense, as in a sense of the literal sense. Now that we've got a bit of a grasp of the literal sense, we can use that literal sense as our springboard into what we call the spiritual senses, the allegorical, the anagogical, and the moral. Or in other words, where can we find God, the church, and the human person in this passage? So we're going to begin by looking at where we can find God in this passage. What does this passage reveal to us about God? And what we're going to find is that we, find, we discover that God has chosen to love the world in a particular way through the mission of his son, Jesus, which fulfills the Old Testament and reaches its completion in his cross and resurrection. And we're going to look first at the part of this passage, which is probably the most familiar to us. It's verse 16, which tells us God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. And this verse is in many ways like the bridge between the two parts of Jesus's conversation with Nicodemus, because they've been talking about salvation. Jesus has told Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life, eternal life. So we're talking about salvation here, about living with God forever in heaven, free from sin and death. But now with verse 16, Jesus' teaching is being moved forward by this reference to God's love. There's this new concept being introduced, the love of God. God gives the son to the world because he loves the world. The engine, if you like, the driving force of God's salvific act of the sending, the giving of the son is love. Now, in John's gospel, Jesus often describes himself as being sent by the father. In this particular passage, he describes himself as being given by the father. And that's actually quite unusual in John's gospel. Usually John talks about Jesus being, or rather the Joannine Jesus, Jesus as John presents him talks about himself as being sent by the father. So later on in John chapter three, we read, he whom God has sent, and here Jesus is speaking about himself, 
speaks the words of God, he whom God has sent. And then later on in John's gospel, in chapter five, Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me, so that's the father, has eternal life. And here we've got a link between the sending and the eternal life, which we should bear in mind. So Jesus talks about himself as being sent by the father. And this language ties into the language that the church uses to describe who Jesus is. If we look in the catechism, in paragraph 257, towards the end of this rather chunky paragraph, which you know is worth reading in full, but I'll just point to the end. We read that God's plan unfolds in the missions of the Son and the Spirit. Now, mission, our English word mission is from the Latin missio, which means basically ascending, to be sent. So when we're talking about mission, we're talking about sending. And so here we've got the language that Jesus uses about himself in the Gospels, tying in to the language that the church uses to teach us about Jesus, because both those Gospels and the teaching of the church share a common source. Both are rooted in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we can go on to see how else the Catechism uses this passage from John, verse 16 of chapter 3. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. We find it being used in paragraph 458, where the, par where the Catechism is explaining to us some of the reasons, or rather the four fundamental reasons, why the incarnation took place within the economy of salvation, within the plan of salvation. Why was it that God became man? And in this particular paragraph, the catechism is talking about one of these four fundamental reasons, which is the word became flesh so that thus we might know God's love. And here we see it quotes John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, as we've just read in our gospel passage for this week. But the interesting thing is you can see that here the catechism is using a slightly different translation. It says, for God so loved the world rather than God loved the world so much. And you might be thinking, well, Sister Karina, it doesn't make that much difference, does it? I think you're being a bit pedantic. But actually, this phrase, God so loved the world, gets a little bit closer to the heart of the original Greek meaning of the text. So when we read God loved the world so much, so much translates the Greek phrase hutos egapeson, which more accurately is God loved the world in this particular way, through this means, is talking about the manner in which the love was shown. It's not talking about the depth or the intensity of the love. It's not saying love the word so much, like this much. It's saying God loved the world in this particular way, in this manner. Hutos egapeson. So that raises a question, doesn't it? What is the particular way in which God saves us through the Son? What's the particular way in which God loved the world? Well, the Son himself has told us in this passage. At the beginning of the passage, he tells us the Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses was lift as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. What does that mean? Well, it is a reference to the book of Numbers, to an incident in chapter 21 of the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, the Israelites are wandering through the desert. They've been freed from slavery in Egypt, as recounted in the book of Exodus. And they're now wandering through the desert on their way to the promised land. But the journey is beset by their temptations to despair, sin and idolatry. And in Numbers 21, the Israelites are having another bout of grumbling against the Lord. So we read the people spoke against God and against Moses, they grumbled. And in response, the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many Israelites 
died. After Moses prays for the people, the Lord gives the solution. We read, the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. Whenever a serpent bit someone, the person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. So what's going on here? The people of Israel are suffering as a result of their sin, which is symbolized by the poisonous serpents. And their healing comes when they look upon the bronze serpent, which God commands Moses to raise up or to lift up. Now, the catechism talks about this bronze serpent. In, oh, I've gone on to the wrong page. In paragraph, oh man, I haven't put it in. I'm so sorry. But if you look up paragraph um, 2130 in the catechism, the paragraph highlights the bronze serpent as one of the images that pointed symbolically towards salvation by the incarnate word. So the bronze serpent was an image that pointed towards salvation by the incarnate word. Why does it point towards salvation? Well, just as the bronze serpent was raised up on a pole so that God could heal the people of Israel of their sin through it. Just trying to find that. There we go. So Jesus is raised up on the wood of the cross in order that he, who is not merely an instrument of God, but actually God made man, could heal the whole world of our sin. And actually, even within the Old Testament itself, the bronze serpent is understood simply as a sign of God's desire to heal us of our sin, something whose true significance will be realised later on in salvation history. The, the, the story of the bronze serpent is kind of a foretaste of what God wants to do entirely, fully, wholly, completely to the whole of humanity. So, for instance, if we look in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 16, the Book of Wisdom talks about the incident in the Book of Numbers with the bronze serpent. And it's addressed to the people of Israel. We read, or rather, it's, it's speaking of God and of the people of Israel, we read, they were troubled for a little while as a warning and received a symbol of deliverance, that's the bronze serpent, to remind them of your law's command. For the one who turned towards it was saved not by the thing that was beheld, but by you, the saviour of all. So here the book of wisdom is saying, you know that thing with the bronze serpent in the desert? The person who turned towards the bronze serpent looked at it and was healed of their, of their sin and healed of death. They weren't saved by that bronze serpent. They were saved by you, God, using the serpent as an instrument. So God uses the bronze serpent as an instrument to partially bring about what he is fully and completely going to bring about through the cross of his son, Jesus. Salvation, being saved from our sins. So God loved the world in this particular way through the cross of Jesus. And one of the ways in which we know this is seeing how the writers of the New Testament understand God's love. They understand it as something which is shown forth for us and fulfilled in the mystery of Christ's passion and death. So, for instance, if we turn to the letter to the Romans, chapter five, St. Paul tells us God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then St. John in his first letter says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And through Jesus's use of the Old Testament, in this case, the book of Numbers and the incident of Moses and the bronze serpent, through that use of the Old Testament, we discover that the cross, the particular way in which God in Jesus fulfills salvation history sorry the particular way in which god loved the world is also the fulfillment of salvation history so the particular way in which god chooses to love us 
It's not by just like bursting onto the scene suddenly without warning through the birth of Jesus. Instead, he reveals himself to us gradually over time through the events and language of the Old Testament. And this link between the Old Testament and the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't something that we just invented. Instead, we find this link in the very words of Jesus, who calls on the events of salvation history recorded in the Old Testament, such as the bronze serpent, to reveal who he is. This is how the Catechism sums it up in paragraph 128. We read, the church as early as apostolic times, so the time of the apostles, and then constantly in her tradition, has illuminated the unity of the divine plan in the two testaments through typology, which discerns in God's works of the old covenant, so the Old Testament, prefigurations of what he accomplished in the fullness of time in the person of his incarnate son. And we talked a little bit about typology last time I did the webinar, so about two weeks ago. So from this passage, we discover that God loved the world in a particular way through the cross of his son, Jesus which fulfills the plan of salvation begun in the Old Testament. So, God has sent his son into the world. And the question now is, how does the world choose to respond? And at this point, we can start to look at what this passage reveals to us about the human person. And we're going to start by looking at the language of darkness and light in the passage. Because there's a lot of talk in this passage about darkness and light, of men choosing evil deeds because they turn away from the light and towards darkness. And this language of darkness and light, we're going to see that that links into the other themes of this passage, like condemnation, belief, those who believe, and eternal life. Because in this gospel passage, we've got a lot of concepts coming at us at once. As I've said, you know, darkness, light, eternal life, belief evil deeds. And at first, it might seem that all these concepts are fairly not linked as a bit of a scattergun teaching. But actually, we can see that they are all linked in the theology that St. John wants to present to us. So we've read in the passage that Jesus has come into the world, not to give condemnation, but to offer eternal life through belief in him. We hear that men perform evil deeds because they reject the light and prefer darkness. So linking all these concepts together, we're going to start by looking at the idea of light, because from the very beginning of John's gospel, light is a big theme. So if we turn to chapter one of John's gospel, very famous passage of the scriptures, you probably all know it, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. If we go to verse 5, we read, what has come into being in him, that's Jesus, the word of God, was life, and the light was the, sorry, the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Then a bit later on in John 1, 9, we read, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. So from the very beginning of his gospel, John is presenting Jesus to us as light, the light of the world, which enlightens everyone. And linking that light to the idea of life. But the thing is, interestingly, in this passage, we've also got a link between the light of Jesus and understanding. Because when we read the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it, the Greek word for overcome is katalaben, and it can also mean to understand. So often it's translated apprehend, because then you've got those two meanings of both seize and sort of understand or comprehend. So when we say the darkness did not overcome it, we can also say the darkness did not understand it. And then so when we go on to read that Jesus is the true light which enlightens everyone, we can remember that enlighten doesn't just mean like to shine on something. It also means to give a person understanding. The light that enlightens all men 
the light that gives us understanding. So the light of Jesus is linked to understanding. Also, if you like knowledge, knowledge and understanding. That's what the light of Jesus gets linked to at the very beginning of John's gospel. But knowledge and understanding of what? And what's the purpose of the knowledge and understanding that the light of Jesus gives us? Well, John goes on to make that very clear in his gospel. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells us, if you know me, you will know my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then later in John, in chapter 17, Jesus says to the father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So the knowledge of Jesus is knowledge of God, the father. Now, that very long discourse in John chapter 17, which is worth reading in full, especially um, as we approach Easter and Holy Week. It's good Holy Week reading the discourse in John chapter 17, uh, where Jesus talks with his heavenly father. But it's absolutely full of references to this idea of knowing the father through knowing Jesus and through this knowledge of the father having eternal life. But at the same time, there's a lot of references to believing because in John's gospel, knowledge and belief are held very closely together. So Jesus goes on to say to the father, the words that you gave to me, I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. And in fact, earlier on in John's gospel, um, we had knowledge and belief linked together um, in the lips of Peter, where Peter makes his profession of faith and he says, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So through the light of Jesus, we come to know and believe in God the Father. And through that belief, we have eternal life. So we can see the links starting to come together between all the different concepts in this gospel passage. The light of Jesus enlightens us by enabling us to know God the Father and to believe in him. Sorry, just sorting out a technical difficulty. So yes, the light of Jesus enlightens us, enabling us to know God the Father and to believe in him. And knowing and believing in God the Father through knowing in, and believing in his son Jesus is to have eternal life. Jesus is exhorting us in this passage to look to him, look to his light, to see and know and understand God the Father, and therefore to believe in him and to share in eternal life. And so now we can understand that reference to the evil deeds that Jesus makes in this passage, where he says that those who prefer darkness perform evil deeds. If we pre prefer evil deeds, it's because we have turned away from the light of Christ through which we receive the knowledge of and belief in God the Father, which brings eternal life. So in this passage, the choice between good deeds and bad deeds, between salvation, also between salvation and condemnation, pivots on one thing, and it's nothing to do with human beings. It's the light of Christ. We come into it in terms of whether we choose to accept or reject the light of Christ, to turn towards it or turn away from it. But it's not our own strength or our own abilities that's getting everything done here. Jesus hasn't been sent to us as some kind of external examiner to assess how, to a sort of assess how good we're doing at being saved. That's not how it works. He's come as the light of the world so that we may turn to the light, believe in him and receive that eternal life as a gift. But of course, if we choose to turn away from that light, a consequence follows. As Jesus says, the fruit of that is evil deeds. And this ties into the idea of condemnation in the passage and the idea that God has not come to condemn the world. Now, the passage doesn't tell us that condemnation isn't going to happen, but it's not the purpose, the desire which God has in being sent into the world. 
Jesus tells us in John chapter 5 that very truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. But then in contrast, in John chapter 12, just above the passage from John 5, we read, the one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. On the last day, the word that I have spoken will serve as a judge. So the light is presented to us. The word is presented to us. We have a choice whether to accept or reject it. If we accept it, we have all the help, all the grace we need to receive eternal life. If we don't, there is a consequence. We have, there's the fruit of our actions, which is our evil deeds. And in fact, it's interesting that when the catechism talks about condemnation and condemn, it doesn't talk of condemnation as a kind of a direct operation of God. It speaks of it as an operation of the human conscience, which God has created, you know, and which operates within the economy of salvation. But still, in paragraph 1790, we read, a human being must always obey the certain judgment of his conscience. If he were deliberately to act against it, he would condemn himself. So again, we need to think about how Jesus is saying in this passage, he has not come into the world to condemn the world. He's come to offer the world eternal life through belief in him, through the light he brings. But nevertheless, he will respect our free choice if we wish to turn away from that light. The loss of eternal life, which we can call condemnation, is a kind of consequence of a free choice that a human being has made. We can never get accidentally condemned. We can never get inadvertently condemned, inadvertently lose our eternal life. But it is a possibility if we prefer darkness, as the passage puts it, and see that the fruit of that is evil deeds. So there we have the human person called the light of Christ who has come into the world, that light has come into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved through him, may receive eternal life. And we can look now, we can turn now to find the church in this passage, because we've seen that the language of darkness and light and how it links into the language of condemnation and eternal life and belief reveals to us something important about the human person, that the basis of you know, our moral life, of our good choices, and also the basis of our salvation is not ourselves and our own strength, but Christ, the light of the world. As Jesus says, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but may have eternal life. And we've seen how this offer of eternal life is kind of the basis of the judgment that we undergo at our death, whether we will receive the fullness of that eternal life in heaven or the condemnation, which is the loss of eternal life. And we're going to stick with this language of darkness and light to help us to understand where we can find the church in this passage, because we're going to find the church in the sacrament of baptism, which is also, as you may know, called the sacrament of enlightenment or the sacrament of illumination because it is through the sacrament of baptism that we are united in faith to Christ. It's through baptism that we are able to believe in him and thus be raised up with him to eternal life. And at this point let's go back to verse 16 of our gospel passage. God loved the world so much or if you prefer God so loved the world. I certainly prefer God so loved the world because what Jesus is saying here is God loved the world in this particular way. And we've seen that this particular way means through the incarnate life of the son whose mission fulfills salvation history and is completed in his raising up on the cross and his passion, his death, which leads to his raising up to new life. As Jesus puts it himself, the son of man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. 
so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. His lifting up, lifting up on the cross, lifting up to new resurrected life is the particular way in which God saves us. Now, it's notable that both in this passage and elsewhere, when Jesus talks about being raised up to eternal life, he doesn't talk about it in sort of individual terms. It's very rarely something that just happens to him. If we turn to John chapter 6, verse 39 onwards, we read Jesus saying, This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my father, that all who see the son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. And then we can turn to chapter 11 of John's gospel with the raising of Lazarus, where Jesus says to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, your brother will rise again. And then we read, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So on the lips of Jesus, the language of lifting up and of raising up becomes the language of resurrection, the language of eternal life and salvation. It is through his cross on which he is first lifted up that we are all lifted up to eternal life. The gift of eternal life is given to those who know and believe in him and thus know and believe the father who gives eternal life. Now, that's all very well for the people who knew Jesus in his earthly life 2000 years ago. You know, those who were with him at the time of the crucifixion, who looked upon him on the cross, who saw the blood and water pouring from his side. But what about us today? Because from what we've read in the Gospel of John, Jesus clearly intends this grace of salvation to be for everybody, for the whole world. In these passages we've just read, we see references to the world and to all. I'll go back to look at them briefly. You know, anyone who hears my word, I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. Those who believe in me, everyone who lives and believes in me. It's clear that Jesus is, is talking very broadly here. He's talking about everybody. So how does this grace of eternal life come to us? How does the light of Christ, the light through which we know and believe, which brings us that eternal life, come to us today? Well, all these themes and images that Jesus presents to us in this gospel passage, light, life, belief, are all used by the church to help us to understand the sacrament of baptism. So if we turn to the catechism now, and paragraph 1216, the catechism tells us that in the early church, the ba baptism was called enlightenment. And here it quotes St. Justin Martyr, who says, this path is called enlightenment because those who receive this catechetical instruction are enlightened in their understanding. So that's a quote from St. Justin Martyr, but then the Catechism goes on to quote from various parts of the scriptures. So we read, having received in baptism the word, the true light which enlightens every man, the person baptized has been enlightened. He becomes a son of light. Indeed, he becomes light himself. Now this is a patchwork of different scripture quotations which I can take you through briefly now. If I go down, oh dear, wrong page. So when the catechism talks of the true light that enlightens every man, that's St. John's description of Jesus from John chapter one, verse nine. Enlightened is taken from the letter to the Hebrews, which describes to its audience the time after you had been enlightened, meaning the time after you have been baptized. 
then the idea of being a son of light or children of the light we get from the first letter to the Thessalonians where Paul describes the church in Thessalonica as children of light we are not of the night or of darkness and then finally the idea that we actually become light through baptism is found again in the letters of Saint Paul in the letter to the Ephesians chapter 5 where he says to the church at Ephesus for once you were darkness but now in the Lord you are light But baptism is not only the sacrament of enlightenment, the sacrament of light, but also the sacrament of belief or of faith. So we, if we go back to the catechism, we can see that this theme of belief, of believing in Jesus, that comes out in this gospel passage, we also find in how the church talks about baptism. In paragraph 1253, we read, baptism is the sacrament of faith. But faith needs the community of believers. It is only within the faith of the church that each of the faithful can believe. And then in paragraph 1266, we read, The Most Holy Trinity gives the baptized the grace that enables them to believe in God. So the foundation of our belief is the grace we have received through baptism, the sacrament of faith. That is how we come to know and believe in God and in the one he has sent, Jesus Christ, and thus share in eternal life. So we can see that this invitation to believe and have eternal life through the light of the world, Jesus Christ, comes to us today through baptism, the sacrament of enlightenment and belief. that's our gospel for the fourth Sunday of Lent we've seen that God has chosen to love the world in a very particular way through the mission of his son Jesus which fulfills the Old Testament and reaches its completion in his cross and resurrection and we've seen how the language of darkness and light can help us to find the human person which reveals to us that the basis of our moral life our good or bad choices and the basis of our salvation is not our own strength, but Christ, the light of the world. And also that language of darkness and light and that language of belief and life has helped us to find the church in the passage through the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament which is also called illumination or enlightenment, which unites us through faith to Christ, enabling us to believe in him and thus share in his promise of eternal life. So there we go. I think we've got a couple of questions in the chat box. And also, while I'm answering these, Sister Lucy, I'm very sorry to spring this on you. But if you could find the links to the upcoming stuff that the sisters have got going on, such as our St. Joseph's retreat and our Tridium, our Tridium talks, that would be amazing. So, yes, we've got, as I, as I, as I so eloquently put, some upcoming stuff. Uh, with the sisters to help you prepare um, for various things like, you know, Easter, the, the sacred Paschal Tridium, and also the, the upcoming solemnity of St. Joseph, who we're fairly keen on being the Dominican sisters of St. Joseph. And even if we weren't, we'd still be keen on him because he's an awesome saint. So, ah, oh, Holly wants to know what font I'm using. Farvin has answered, yes, it is, it is Calibri Light, which is my favourite font. Um, I like how it looks. It's, it's actually the headings version, but I use it for just normal text because I don't think it looks quite nice. I, I hope you all find it easy to read. I know um, not everybody finds all, all different fonts easy to read. Ah, oh, Grania, I have recently bought a copy of the Catechism, which is quite a mighty tome. It certainly is. Could you advise the best approach for starting to read it or should one just dive in? Well, you've got a few answers in the in the chat box. I agree with Farvin that section four on prayer is great. And actually, I think section four on prayer, if you if you took a, like a paragraph a day of spiritual reading, that would be a, a really, a really useful, fruitful exercise, I think, because it is so beautifully written and it's broken up into helpful pre-made chunks with the paragraphs. Just taking like a paragraph a day of spiritual reading um, would be really beautiful. 
Sister Lucy has said that using the catechism as a reference book, yeah, that's really useful. And also, especially if you um, if you happen to look up a couple of topics in quick succession, you'll see how all the teachings are interlinked. Um, and that's that's a very a very fruitful experience to see how you know there are the the the, the themes of the fundamentals of the church's teaching are woven through the whole catechism, such as the Trinity. Um, so yes, using it as a reference book. What also might be interesting is if you turn to the back, there's a scriptural index of all the different times that passages from the scriptures are referenced in the catechism. And what what might be quite interesting is to maybe look up um, like the the upcoming Sunday's gospel passage in the in that scripture index in the catechism and see how the catechism uses it to expound a particular church teaching. Like, I mean, for instance, if you were to look up this coming Sunday's gospel in the catechism, one of the results you would get from the scriptural index would be um, paragraph 458. The word became flesh so that thus we, must know, that thus we might know God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So that might be an interesting way of doing it. Another way that's occurred to me is that you, you can get books um, such as um, Catholic Truth Society publishes a book called Catechism in a Year. And so that gives you like a key passage from the catechism, one for each day of the year. Um, it doesn't take you through in like a linear way, like paragraph one to paragraph, you know, three, six, five, because that's how many days are on the year. But it, it picks up some really key core passages from the catechism one for each day of the year to like build up a sense of the the overall kind of structure and like the web of the church's teachings so yes catechism in a year published by catholic truth society that's that's a good way oh and heather has put a good resource um i've not heard of this myself but if heather's recommending it i'm sure it's great i'll have a look at that after after the webinar heather that looks very that looks very interesting. So yes, Jennifer, uh, sorry, Heather's put a, a podcast on the catechism for you to have a look at. Our oh, father's talked about the catechism in a year. Brilliant. Now then. OK, yes, I'm just going to talk about um, some of the things that Sister Lucy has put in the chat box so if you look at the chat box on click meeting and we can maybe put these in the um facebook uh on the facebook live video comments later but it is nearly the feast of saint joseph the 19th of this month is the solemnity of saint joseph spouse of the blessed virgin mary foster father of our lord jesus christ and as we're the dominican sisters of saint joseph we want to share in some celebration with you we've got some zooms planned as part of a kind of online retreat slash party so as part of this retreat slash party feel free to join us for all our live streamed prayers via our live stream camera but also we've got a zoom party on friday evening where we're inviting everybody this is friday the 19th where we're inviting you all to come and listen to some stories about how St. Joseph has helped us in our lives, but also share your own stories of St. Joseph. If you've got a devotion to St. Joseph, we'd love to hear from you. So that's going to be good fun. Then on Saturday, we've got some, some reflections, some more reflective talks. In On Saturday morning, I'm going to be talking about what St. Joseph tells us about how much God values the human family, about how important human families are, in God's plan of salvation. Even if you think, you know, oh, my family, there's nothing special about my family. Actually, your family plays an important role in God's plan of salvation. And then in the afternoon, Sister Yassant will be talking about how we can discover more about St. Joseph through the art of the church. Discover um, St. Joseph's place in the plan of salvation through some of the really beautiful artwork that the church has produced celebrating him. And as many of you know, Sister Yassant is doing a Zoom every Monday evening on the subject of hope, finding hope in the scriptures. So you're very welcome to join us for those, those Zooms on finding hope in the scriptures. 
Sister Lucy is selling Easter cards in our Etsy Domina card shop. And also in the, on the first link, I think that Sister Lucy has put, actually, I'm not sure. Oh no, not on the first link. Um, but maybe next week we can post the um, links to our Easter Tridium talks because over the Easter Tridium, um, we will also be offering some reflections for you to help you go deeper into um, this incredibly sacred and important time of the year. So there we go. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. It was a bit of a bombardment of information from me at the end. But I hope you find something to, to enjoy and to join us for. And we're going to finish, as always, by turning to Our Lady in prayer, giving thanks for our time together. And I'm always very grateful to hear how much you, you know, enjoy these webinars and get something out of them, because I, I find it a very fruitful experience um, preparing these webinars. And I just really enjoy spending this time with you talking about the scriptures and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us through the scriptures, um, you know, because the, the Holy Spirit being the author of the scriptures, you know, whatever enlightenment you found through this webinar, you know, whatever insight you've gained through this webinar, you know, that is the, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. So we can give thanks to God now through the prayers of the Mother of God as we turn to Our Lady and pray, Mary, Virgin and Mother, you who moved by the Holy Spirit, welcomed the word life in the depths of your humble faith as you gave yourself completely to the eternal one help us to say our own yes to the urgent call as pressing as ever to proclaim the good news of jesus mother of the living gospel wellspring of happiness for god's little ones pray for us amen not that word that i've left on the powerpoint i'm so sorry i've led you into temptation we could stay and said, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of eternal glory. Yeah, won't be seeing that word again for another three weeks. So thank you so much for coming, everybody. As I say, we really enjoy spending this time with you. And I really hope that your love and appreciation of this Sunday's gospel has been helped in some way through this webinar. I hope you have a lovely rest of your week. Sister Yassant will be back next Wednesday for the for next Sunday's gospel which as usual, I, I don't know ahead of time. This is really terrible. I should, I should know ahead of time what next Sunday's gospel is. But anyway, if you have a wonderful week, stay safe. Hope you're all getting vaccinated. God bless. Bye.